and I believe Clark knew, I believe our, uh, our uh, I believe this is a good time to go back to, um, we have some guests who have appeared on our budget and audit committee item, which are uh, uh, Joseph Purvis or, and or Mitch Hansen from Clark Newber. Is that accurate? Yep. That is accurate. Fantastic. Uh, and, we have, and we have our CFO back online. Um, yeah. I'm about to uh, apologize for the, the results of the okay. process and execution audit. Those materials on page 262. Uh, thank you all for your work on the Rule 6 program. And now we'll move on to this. So Joseph, uh, I think Rex was going to uh, put up the presentation for us. There you go. Great. All right. Well, uh, glad to be here this afternoon to present the results of the fiscal administrative project uh, that we did for you. Uh, we started the project uh, shortly before year end. We were out on site doing our testing uh, in February and March, presented the re preliminary results to the Budget and Audit Committee in April and, and are now pleased to be here today to present the results to you. Uh, if you wanna flip to the next slide, please. Uh, on, this side you, uh, on this slide, you can see a summary of the project. The scope of the project is we were looking at the transactions that were occurred uh, that occurred in the fiscal year September 30, 2018. And our approach was a three-phased approach. So in the planning phase, we spent quite a bit of time up front working with members of the board to really scope it out and come up with a, a plan that addressed the concerns of the organization. Uh, then we moved into the testing phase, and it was really a three-pronged approach to do that. Uh, the first prong was we wanted to just take a sample of transactions, look at how those transactions were being handled, look at the backup behind those transactions. Uh, we also wanted to use our data mining software. Uh, there's a, a variety of tests that we can do on your accounting transactions looking for red flags. And so uh, we applied those data analytics. And then the third phase was uh, just talking with staff and, and it, making inquiries uh, to see if there were any red flags there. Uh, and then uh, we from there moved into the reporting phase where we uh, summarized our findings. We, we presented them to the, the project team that was overseeing the, uh, what we were doing. Uh, and then uh, that all culminated in the written report, which I hope you've all had a chance to read through. And uh, we are here today to, to report out to you on the results, but also to answer any questions that you have. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Joe Purvis to walk us through the, the detailed procedures we did and the results. Yeah. So the first thing we'll look at here is, uh, if you go to the next slide, is just kind of the overall um, planning part of the process. And really, this the procedures that were planned were done in tandem with the fiscal activity assessment team, which was the, the CFO, the general counsel, and, and the WISBA treasurer. So we had a good blend of individuals that were um, helping lead this project and figure out the scope. And they all stayed very actively involved in this project as we um, went through different iterative procedures in the process. Uh, with that, one of the, the key determinations was, well, what's going to be our in-scope systems and what are we going to test? So determining what databases that we're going to do the analytics over that uh, Mitch was referencing earlier, and then also determining how much to test. So what is the adequate amount of transactions to look through? and uh, which, which ones. And so we worked with them to develop an overall scope of work to determine activity, how many transactions and um, where we were gonna be able to utilize judgment and take kind of a, a risk-based approach at selecting transactions for testing to make sure that they were processed in accordance with your systems. The last part of the planning phase was really to get a detailed understanding of the organization's fiscal policies and procedures. So uh, we've understood the fiscal policies and procedures well as it relates to internal controls over financial reporting, but 
one of the things that was a little bit different in this project than say a standard audit is that we're getting a lot more into your operational controls around uh, expenses and what different policies and procedures are in place around there. So really getting a good understanding of, of that baseline um, through the organization's fiscal policies and procedures handbook and the employee handbook being the key documents that we utilized in that part of the process. If you go to the next slide, we then uh, jumped into the testing phase of the audit. And the first one was related to using our computer-driven data analytics process. And what we did here is we identified three in-scope um, data four in scope databases that we wanted to look at. The first one being the payroll database, uh, the credit card database, the accounts payable submodule, and your vendor master file. So really looking at the different ways that cash can get dispersed outside of the organization and doing analytics over those files. The kinds of things that we're looking at when we're doing these data analytics are unusual spikes with certain vendors, transactions that are right under uh, dollar authorization thresholds. So things that just would um, appear to be anomalies or look funny. And um, going through that process, what we what we found is we there's different transactions that um, working with the fiscal assessment team that we wanted to do more digging around. And, and so we went through that process and didn't find any concerns um, through that, but we're able to kind of identify um, different transactions to look into more. So that was the first prong of our testing approach. The second prong was doing really detailed transaction analysis. So we identified specific transactions mainly related to uh, expense reimbursements, credit card charges, cell phone reimbursements, and board committee expenditures and analyzed if those were processed in accordance with the different fiscal policies that exist for the organization. Uh, and we did this through uh, identifying uh, a, a number of specific transactions in each of those areas that we wanted to test, and then in detail testing them back to their policies. The next thing we did is, um, just took a kind of a cash approach and made sure that everything for one month in a bank statement that uh, was going through as disbursements were correctly getting coded into the general ledger and accounting records. And then the last detailed transaction analysis was to look at a series of payroll charges and make sure that everything was approved in accordance with the organizational's policies and authorization limits. So that was the, the second prong was really a, a, a very detailed transaction test um, over a sample of transactions in, in really specified areas that were identified with that team. The last phase of it was uh, inquiries with management and the board and um, other individuals. And really here, we're just trying to identify if there's any other concerns about how items are being processed within the organization. And then just getting the best understanding that we could of how the organization was complying with the policies and procedures that were put in place. So that takes us to our reporting phase. And here's uh, the next few slides are gonna kind of summarize the, the main findings that we had as a result of this project. And the first one is related to just the expense policies and procedures as a whole. And what we found was that um, in certain places, there is not um, not the system in place to document an acceptable deviation from a standard policy, or it's not clear who is subject to a certain policy. So uh, to give you one detailed example here, what we saw is that certain travel requires pre-approval. If, if it's not um, in the nature of the person's job description, well, the systems aren't really in place to identify who would be subject to that policy and uh, nor gain pre-approval if it's required. So the recommendation here is to consider policy modifications or to implement processes that support the current policy that's in place. Um, the, the detailed report, if you look at it, will outline which specific policies we had identified, such as that travel pre-approval process that I had mentioned there. Another one that came up, um, was hotel lodging, where there's um, a requirement, there's a limit on the amount that could be paid for lodging for a night. And we saw instances in which lodging was above that amount. 
And there is acceptable deviations for that process. Like if it's the conference, uh, conferences hotel, or there's no lodging available at under the rate, uh, but there's no way there is no way in the organization to capture that documentation that supports that it was an acceptable deviation as the controls are currently designed. Moving on to the next recommendation, um, we saw instances in which there just was transactions not processed in accordance with the policies, and a lot of this related to meals. Uh, there's a certain meal threshold dollar threshold for each meal of the day and um, a deviation if you were to have three meals during the period then you would be subject to a total maximum amount for the day and what we saw here is in certain instances the the controls didn't operate in a way that um, stopped for meals to begin reimbursed in in excess of those applicable rates so we recommend that there's a structure put in place that ensures that these policies are being adhered to or um, if there is a deviation, uh, that it captures that and, and um, allows for it, and there's documentation around, around that process. The next recommendation relates to compensation policy. So in the, uh, in the fiscal policies and procedures, there is the, in establishing the, um, authorities to the different individuals in the organization and the board. There is the authority of the uh, the board level or the committee level to set the overall compensation plan of which the executive director operates under. And um, it wasn't very clear what exactly was getting established through that compensation plan, if it was the total budget amount or um, and there also was, I believe, some inconsistencies between exactly how the compensation plan is identified in the fiscal policies and procedures and having more information on it in the employee handbook. So we just recommend that the fiscal policies and procedures be updated yeah. to um, fully identify what, identify what's what being established through that compensation yeah. plan and to uh, kind of align with the other organizational documents. And then our last um, observation here is when we were doing our data analytics over the vendor database, what we found was that there is a high volume of duplicate vendors included in the database and there's just a high v um, volume of vendors in total based on the size of the organization. And so our recommendation here, and I believe the finance team has already actually implemented this, is that they go through and, and look at all the different vendors and delete out any unused vendors, um, consolidate them down. And, and the real uh, risk here would be that it's two, twofold. One, that you would have false vendors in your vendor master file. Um, so individuals being able to receive payment that that wouldn't otherwise, and then also just operationally, it would it's difficult to manage a larger vendor list. So you should get some operational efficiencies by cutting down that listing. I'll give you a uh, a recent example of where why this is important and and how it can be abused. Uh, if you don't have good controls over setting up vendors in your system and and periodically flushing out the ones you don't use anymore, you can get uh, duplicates in there. And at the Pierce County Housing Authority down in Tacoma, the CFO started abusing that process uh, by taking these inactive vendors and running invoices through them. And she had the, the bank routing information set up as her own personal account. And the organization was cutting checks to what were legitimate vendors, but they were duplicates in the system. And she was able to steal about $6.9 million with this vendor takeover scheme before she was finally caught. And tighter controls over setting up vendors and, and periodically cleaning those out could have prevented this. So that was the, the key takeaways from our 
um, fiscal assessment there and open it up to any questions. Governor Swagel. Looks like you might be on mute there. He's just respectful you. I'm, uh, for me to recognize him. Governor Swagel. Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm one of the individuals who was uh, kind of for years keenly interested in uh, having uh, an audit process like this. Um, and I'm curious, uh, you know, I guess I have a couple questions. Like, first of all, um, do you feel that the scope of this audit was you know, what, what's what's the probability or the percentage of likelihood that this audit captured any potential financial wrongdoing of, of any serious magnitude, like, for example, a vendor takeover? That's the type of thing I was hoping would be done. I was hoping there would be a very uh, diligent scrub down of travel for the last few years um, and just other opportunities like that vendor takeover type scheme uh, for getting money out of the entity uh, in uh, problematic ways for uh, Im improper purposes. So uh, I could respond to that. Uh, when you couple what we did here with what we uh, do on the financial statement audit, your, your probability is very high. So the financial statement audit is designed to catch material fraud. That's you know, We're looking for misstatements in your financial statements that are material that could mislead a reader. Um, this, this builds off of the work that, or the benefit of having that audit because it's casting a broader net. We came at this from three different directions. We took samples of what were viewed to be the higher risk areas. They're uh, typically smaller dollar amounts, fairly immaterial from an audit perspective, but uh, more likely to, to, to possibly contain ab abuse. So there was detailed transaction testing looking in those areas. Uh, another way of identifying potential fraud is through the, the data mining and running those tests, looking for transactions on the weekends, after hours, checks written to cash, checks with blank payees, things like that that are just really red flags for potential fraud. And then finally, you know, if you think back to 2002, 2003, our profession really had a black eye. There were so many big frauds with Enron, WorldCom, Tyco, that our profession called a timeout, they looked at these frauds, and they said, what could the auditors have done differently to detect these frauds that were going on? And one of the things they found was that, you know, the auditors really don't get outside the accounting department. There were people in the organizations that knew fraud was going on, but nobody asked them. And so, that was the third prong of this approach was getting out and talking to people and just asking them what, you know, what are their concerns? Is there anything we should be aware of? And so I think when you take that three pronged approach, casting a very broad net and then couple that with the financial statement fraud that's designed to, to detect material fraud, I, I think your, your probability is very high. Very good. Maybe just one follow-up question. Um, so you did, I mean, it sounded like you found what may be just immaterial um, variances from the travel policy with respect to meals where there was a cap, but the cap was blown through and the payments were made based on the uncapped expenses. Uh, was that a, did you find any substantial patterns? Is it, was that associated with any specific individuals or was it just random and sort of throughout the system? Yeah, it was kind of throughout the different for, a, forms of reimbursement. So uh, expense reimbursements, credit cards, um, also boarding committee travel. So it, it really spanned all the different areas that we had selected for testing. And it, I wouldn't say it was pervasive in any one area. Um, I think in most of these transaction areas, we were selecting more than 10, and it was less than a, a few of those transactions in each instance, in each of those different areas. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's it's nice. 
Um, there's no reason to believe that really there's anything wrongdoing going on in WSBA, but one of the important functions of this board of governors is to do audits to to make sure that our, what our good faith assumption shows is, is correct. And I'm so glad to hear the results of this. Any other questions or comments by the governor? Well, I deeply appreciate the work Clark Newberg has done on this. I really appreciate the work CFO uh, Perez and Treasurer Clark have done on facilitating this and making this happen. And I really appreciate the two of you taking your time here to come and report to the board. Uh, this is an important uh, part of our work and Governor Clark has some comments. You're on mute. I would add as well. Um, what I wanted to say is we took, this board said that they wanted a, um, okay, I, 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 I mean, some real deep dive, and, and, and that's what we did. We went really, really in depth. We looked at, at things, and, and we, made, we made sure to do that. So thank you. Yeah, it had been a long time since we'd done anything like that. So I thought it was important that we do that. You know, I think it's important that we do that more regularly because I don't think it had been done for 15 or 20 years. So as fiduciaries, uh, you know, I'm involved with a lot of companies, and a lot of organizations and stuff happens uh, very regularly. Um, I know of one person who's in prison right now for stealing from one of my companies. So yeah, and 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 a very difficult scheme to unravel involving a fake vendor that looked extremely legitimate. So this stuff happens and we need to do a little bit better and more sort of consistent job looking for it. But uh, I'm glad that we didn't find anything material and I really appreciate all the work everyone did myself. Awesome. Great work, governors. Uh, great work, Before staff. Or question or comment. Hey, CFO Perez. I have a question too, Rajiv. Uh, oh, past President Pickett. Yes, after CFO Perez. CFO Can you Perez. hear me now? There you go. Yes. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, no, first of all, I want to thank uh, the team at uh, Clark Nuber. Uh, they're extraordinarily professional. They did a great job with us. That's one thing. Uh, the second thing I don't want to let by is I want to thank personally um, General Counsel uh, Shanklin because she was part of the team and she really directed us towards uh, doing these things in the right way and clarifying and giving us really good guidance on the risk profile of the things that we were performing. So I want to thank her for that. And the last thing I want to say is that as it relates to the mitigation of the points that were that were found, uh, like uh Joe said, we've already cleaned up the vendor master file. That was done about a week after we were told that that was the situation. Uh, we also had an expense training. Uh, we had three sessions of expense trainings to all managers in the month of May, where we clarified uh, the expense policies in terms of meals, in terms of what's included, what are the limits, does it include tips, does it not include tips, because a lot of the deviations uh, uh, many of the times were also just given to misinterpretation of the rules, like do I get three meals every time or do I get one big meal, et cetera. So those things have to be clarified. So we did that. And um, we also uh, did clarification in terms of the travel policy, especially nowadays with so many canceled uh, activities, people didn't know what to do with their canceled uh, flights and things of that nature. So that was all put in place. So we feel that we've taken an aggressive measure against this and that we're very well uh, on our way to getting all of these things corrected. So not, they aren't that many to start with, but they are important. So just want to let all of you know that my team has been working uh, arduously to get all this kind of cleaned up and at the same time, help the organization move forward with more and better information as it relates to these matters. Thank you. Thank you. And General Counsel Shanklin? I don't have anything to add. I know you don't have anything to add. <laughs> I just wanted to see your face and I want to say thank you to you. You know, uh, general counsel's office, uh, especially this year, 2020 has had so much thrown at it. And I know I throw stuff at the general counsel's office all the time. You know, I, I call uh, the executive director a lot, but right after the executive director is the general counsel's number in my phone. And uh, I, I just thank you for being part of that and all the conscientious 
consciousness you throw throughout all the things you're doing for the organization. Thank you. Thank and I appreciate you. CFO Perez highlighting that. Uh, Press President Pickett. Two questions first for Dan and, and Jorge. One, I know at the very beginning of this exercise, we had a lengthy discussion over uh, cost benefit analysis. What would the deep dive cost versus the potential benefit? Do we have final numbers on the costs? Yes, we do. Uh, it was within the budget that we were uh, that we were given. I believe the total cost was thirty five thousand or thirty nine thousand. I don't recall the exact amount right now. Thanks, Jorge. Within the yeah. Thanks, Jorge. And then also for uh, Mitch or Joe, um, given what our costs are, at least on this deep dive, would you have any recommendations for us? Knowing this is a cost conscious. Uh, board uh, that wants to be very careful with the money we spend in terms of when would we need to look at doing uh, another deep dive uh, in the, in the future. That's a great question. You know, uh, as a, as a board, one of your primary responsibilities is risk management. And this is a great way to, to help alleviate some of those risks in the organization. Um, we have some organizations where we uh, do outsourced uh, internal audit work like this. Uh, they have, a, uh, for example, the state auditor's office. We are actually the internal auditors for the state auditor's office. So we go in and we pull transactions and we test compliance of the state auditors with the state rules. Uh, for that organization, they do it on a biennial basis. Uh, so we'll come in uh, every two years and do that. Uh, some organizations, they're, uh, you know, they're more comfortable with doing it on maybe a five-year rotation or a three-year rotation. Super. Thank you. Thank you very much, and your, your work on this is very much appreciated. Just for the newer, our governor-elects, I, please, I hope you take note, one, of the cost, how important it is to consider it, consider the cost of doing something like this, but also Mitch's uh, assessment of how often this should be done. I know when this process started, a little bit of history, there was a great deal of wrangling uh, and disagreement and discussion over whether this process should ever even be undertaken. Um, so I think in the future, my hope is that you can watch the numbers carefully, number one, but number two, also take into consideration doing this type of project on a more regular basis so as to avoid uh, some of that difficult ground that we had to plow through. Th thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Past President. Okay, uh, seeing no other hands raised, I'd like to thank our guests and uh, move on to the next agenda item. Thank you so yeah. much. Oh, yep, is that a waving? Ah, oh, we're just waving. Yeah, good work, everyone. <laughs> good work. Fantastic. Thank you so much.